Each of our panelists tonight brings a unique perspective. In our first segment, Dr. Russell Barkley will discuss the potential consequences of ADHD in adults. In our second segment, Dr. Gregory Mattingly will present new clinical data for Vyvanse in the treatment of ADHD in adults. And then Dr. Salgo will lead our panel in an in-depth, real-world discussion on the clinical experiences with Vyvanse. And so it is my pleasure to lead off tonight's program with Dr. Barkley. Doctor? Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to speak with you this evening about the nature of ADHD in adults and especially about the manner in which ADHD interferes with a variety of major life activities across the lifespan of these adults. Now, all of you know that ADHD is a common child psychiatric condition and it's characterized by difficulties in three areas of psychological or neuropsychological development. First of all, there are problems in the development of attention. But we need to go further than simply saying that because attention is a nonspecific syndrome or symptom, and it's comprised by six different components. And not all of these are disrupted by the disorder. It's helpful for us to think about which of these six neural networks might be more impaired by ADHD that can assist us with clinical diagnosis. Research in the last decade has shown that ADHD interferes with these particular forms of attentiveness. The first is the ability to persist toward a goal, particularly toward a task or toward some future goal. The second is the ability to resist distractions along the way while you are trying to pursue that goal. And finally is the ability to hold in mind what the goal is and the steps to that goal in order, if you are interrupted or distracted, to be able to return to that goal as well. We will see later that the last problem I mentioned it may well be a problem with working memory and other parts of the executive system. But it helps us to think of ADHD and the inattentiveness as involving the persistence resistance to distraction, and this working memory problem. Now, the second domain that's not developing properly in individuals with this disorder is the domain of inhibition. And this is characterized chiefly in early childhood by problems with hyperactivity, and also as the child matures problems with impulsive decision-making, impulsive verbal behavior, and impulsive emotional behavior. Now, ADHD is recognized as a developmental disability, and that means that these areas of psychological development are not progressing on time in the individual. The child or the adult shows a delay in the rate with which these abilities are developing. Now, I do want to emphasize an important point, and that is that symptoms alone do not make the diagnosis of this disorder. There must be clear evidence that there is impairment in major life activities and that the symptoms occur to a degree that is inappropriate for the individual's age. Now, longitudinal studies have indicated that ADHD children, when diagnosed and followed for a period of 10 to 30 years, continue to persist in their ADHD into adulthood. Indeed, up to two-thirds of ADHD children are likely to be fully diagnosable as ADHD adults. And in my most recent study that I will speak about later, we found that using a strict definition of recovery, the actual rate of persistence could be as high as 80 to 85 percent. But even conservatively, we can say that up to two-thirds of these children will remain fully diagnosable as ADHD in adults. Now, based upon the particular study done by Milstein back about 10 years ago, using a relatively large sample of clinic-referred adults, these scientists found that in adulthood, the symptoms of inattentiveness were much more likely to be endorsed by these adults than were the symptoms of hyperactivity or of impulsiveness. As this slide shows, you can see that well over 90% of these adults were manifesting problems in numerous areas that, manif or that characterized inattentiveness, while far less of them were complaining of problems with hyperactivity or impulsivity. That leads us to wonder just how do these symptoms change by the time the ADHD child becomes an adult? Looking first at the inattentive symptoms, we can see that the problems with persistence, resistance to distraction, and working memory begin to broaden out to include problems with self-organization, emotional regulation, with time management, 
uh, as well as with the earlier working memory deficit. So we will see difficulties with forgetfulness and remembering what one is supposed to do, with being uh, or, or with tardiness for work and lack of punctuality and having projects ready on their deadline. So the broader domain of self-regulation and executive functioning begins to become a significant problem by adulthood. So when you think about the inattentive list in the DSM, I want you to think about a broader cognitive domain that involves these executive self-regulatory and time management abilities. Now, the problems with hyperactivity have been found in many studies to decline markedly with age, such that by adulthood, as we found in our UMass study, hyperactivity is of no differential diagnostic value. In fact, a few of the hyperactive symptoms were found to be more indicative of people with anxiety disorders. So don't hang your diagnostic hat on hyperactivity when looking for differential diagnosis. Instead, the problems with impulsiveness start to move further to the, to the uh, foreground, and we begin to see individuals complain not only of difficulties with impulsive behavior, but impulsive decision-making, as well as intrusiveness on others. And our own UMass study found that by adulthood, verbal impulsiveness had separated from the rest of the group to form an, its own separate dimension of adult impairment, probably because of its greater impairing features. We are more likely to forgive impulsive comments by a child than we are by an impulsive adult in the workplace. But nevertheless, we can see that there are both quantitative and qualitative changes in the nature of ADHD symptoms as we move into adulthood. Now, the Kessler study published two years ago uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry, I believe it was, demonstrated that in a large study, uh, epidemiologic study, of a large sample of community adults, that ADHD has a prevalence of about 4.4% in the U.S. population. If we take that number and we extrapolate it using the U.S. Census figures for 2000 to the U.S. population between 18 and 44 years of age, we can see that approximately 9 million or more adults are likely to have ADHD in this country. The figure is probably far higher than that because we've restricted the age range here just to keep the math relatively simple. Now, when Kessler did his study of this uh, national comorbidity survey, he found that out of all of these adults, only about one in 10, or approximately 10.9% of them, had ever been treated for their adult ADHD within the past 12 month period. And while about 44% of them had received some sort of treatment for some other disorder, usually a comorbid disorder with ADHD, it was only about one in 10 had received treatment specifically for their adult ADHD. This translates then, if we use those census figures I've already mentioned, to a figure of conservatively, 8 million adults in the United States are currently undiagnosed and untreated with adult ADHD. That's a staggering number, and it illustrates that one of the biggest problems we have right now in the field of ADHD is this massive undertreatment of this adult population. Now, when we think about diagnosing adult ADHD, there are some common features in the backgrounds of these individuals that you might want to pay attention to in addition to the symptoms I've already mentioned. Uh, these have to do with the nature of the impairments one is likely to hear described by these patients and the pervasiveness of the impairments. We're not speaking here about a very discrete impairment in the ability to take the SATs, and that's your only problem. We're referring here to a pervasive pattern of impairment, what my colleagues call the paper trail of impairment that is ubiquitous throughout the lives of these individuals, often dating back to childhood. Now, among the various domains of impairment, we see the most characteristic for adults with ADHD are going to be long-standing impairment in the area of educational activity, particularly throughout high school. And for those who attended college, we're going to hear multiple complaints about difficulties in the ability to complete work, get assignments done on time, meet classes on time, and so forth. The second area that they reported as being most impaired is the area of work. Here we see difficulties with the ability to follow through on instructions and commands, to complete assigned tasks on time. Uh, these individuals often need much more supervision if they're going to be able to get things done. And of course, we see that they have frequent interpersonal problems with other people at work. 
The third area that is most likely to be impaired is the domain of home responsibilities, the ability to care for and raise our children, to pay our bills on time, and to just generally run a household in an organized manner. Adults with ADHD report significant problems in home functioning. Specifically, they also report problems in interpersonal relationships with other family members, including their spouse or partners. And this can often lead to both the partner and the adult with ADHD reporting much lower levels of satisfaction in their marriage. It's no surprise then that some studies have found a higher divorce rate among adults with ADHD. Certainly one is likely to hear that there have been issues that required marital therapy in the history of these individuals. Now, in these patient histories, we are also likely to see that some adults, particularly the high functioning adults with ADHD who may have higher than normal IQs, are likely to have discovered compensatory strategies to help them cope with their ADHD and make it somewhat less impairing. So you need to watch for these because sometimes it'll mislead you into thinking that the individual either doesn't have ADHD or isn't impaired because they seem to be functioning so well in this area, when in fact what they're using is a much higher frequency of coping or compensatory skills. Adults with ADHD are likely to use journals or a lot of sticky notes or do lists or day planners uh, or Blackberries or other ways of organizing their lives. I was once picked up at the airport by an adult with ADHD who was a drug rep who must have had more than a hundred sticky notes plastered all over the dashboard and windshield. In fact, I was so concerned that he wouldn't even be able to see the roadway while he was driving. But this was his way of compensating for his adult ADHD. Now, sometimes these compensatory strategies can lead these individuals into larger life choices to help cope with it. Some of them may marry very organized individuals who help to uh, help organize their life. They may also hire secretaries or assistants to help organize their office better. Some of them are also likely to choose jobs that allow them to be more vibrant, more active, more sociable, such as door-to-door -door sales or working in the trades or even being in uh, show business uh, or in the performing arts. So they have found compensatory ways of helping to cope with their ADHD. So keep this in mind when you're looking to diagnose ADHD to look for some of these compensatory strategies that they have used because it may lead you to see that there really ought to be more impairment there than there actually is. Now, knowing the symptoms of ADHD, it, it's not rocket science to see how this would cascade into multiple areas of major life activities for adults with ADHD. And this slide just illustrates the potential areas in which ADHD symptoms and the impact on self-regulation and disorganization could have a detrimental effect on their life, all the way from their educational histories, up through their family relationships, legal difficulties, substance use problems, caring for their children, and all the way on up into financial management, uh, as well as their lifestyles and how healthy or unhealthy those happen to be. Now, I'd like to take a moment and share with you some of the recent findings from the UMass study that were published in my book on ADHD adults, which I'm grateful that you've been given a copy of that this evening. In this study done at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in the Department of Psychiatry, we screened consecutive referrals to this clinic looking for those who met DSM-4 criteria for adult ADHD with one exception. They didn't have to have the age of onset of age seven, uh, and uh, that is because that is going to be uh, I think jettisoned from DSM-5. Uh, adults with ADHD can have their onset of symptoms well into their adolescent years. But nevertheless, we were looking for adults with ADHD. Those who were not diagnosed with ADHD were assigned to our clinical control group. Very important control group because it helps us to see what is specific to ADHD and cannot be attributed to general psychopathology. Then, of course, we had the usual control group, which was a community control group of volunteers. Now, Using clinical interviews, as well as getting archival data such as school records, we were able to look at multiple domains of major life activities in these three groups of individuals. And we were able to look at occupational functioning, educational functioning, and so on. Now, just quickly, I can tell you that we had approximately 148 of, uh, or excuse me, 146 adults with ADHD in that group. We had about 109 adults without ADHD who had other disorders, and we had a clinical control or a community control group as well. I've probably got those numbers mixed up a little bit, uh, but you can see on the, uh, on the screen here what those might be. Um, our adults were generally young to middle age. 
reasonably well educated and many of them were uh, Caucasian in their ethnic representation. Now looking at our adults with ADHD, we saw high rates of comorbidity. Over 80% of these adults had at least one other disorder. Over 50% of them had two other disorders. And you can see on the slide here that most common among these comorbid disorders were problems with mood, such as major depression or dysthymia, uh, or anxiety disorders, uh, and to a lesser extent, difficulties with substance dependence and use disorders. Now we did detect a slight uh, elevation in a bipolar disorder and an obsessive compulsive disorder, but they did not exceed the base rate for the general population, or were they any higher than what we saw in our clinical control group. Now, speaking of my clinical control group, they were generally comprised, as you see here, of adults that had anxiety disorders for the most part. Some of them had dysthymia or major depression. Others had drug use disorders to some extent. Some had learning disabilities or simply relationship problems. And approximately 17% of them turned out to have not to have any disorder at at all. Now, in our study, we looked at a variety of major life activities. And among those, the top three, as you see here, were difficulties with home responsibilities, as I've already said, where you see that over 90% of these adults complained of difficulties in this area. In work, nearly 89% had problems in the workplace and in their social functioning, where more than three quarters of them reported impairment in this area. You can see that in ADHD, the impairments exceeded those seen in both of our control groups, showing that ADHD in adult it is a more severe disorder in terms of its impact on major life activities. As I've said, education is an area that ADHD has a uh, massively adverse effect upon, indeed probably number one in terms of the domains of impairment. And you can see here that adults with ADHD struggle to get as much education as the general population, often reporting more grades of DNF, more likely to be retained in grade, less likely to graduate high school, certainly less likely to graduate college. Now, turning to another domain, we see that they also have difficulties in the workplace, and we can examine these quite specifically. We looked at about 12 different domains of functioning. I can't represent them all on this slide, but you can see here that among the more common problems were behavior problems in the workplace, getting along with colleagues or coworkers, difficulties with uh, getting bored on the job and quitting their job as a result of this boredom. Some of them would quit over hostility. Others reported uh, having disciplinary actions filed against them by their bosses. But you can see that in all of these areas, the ADHD adults were much more impaired than either of our control groups. We also looked at the financial management difficulties of these, and I've only chosen just a few of these. There were many that were found in this study. But in looking at how these people had managed their money in their lives, they had a great deal of difficulty saving money, both for current expenses as well, as well as for retirement. They were less likely to have paid their bills on time and therefore were more likely to have their utilities shut off. Also, these adults reported to us that they were likely to engage in impulse buying and also were likely to have their cars repossessed because of failure to pay bank loans. Now, another area that we looked at specifically was the health and lifestyles of these adults. And here again, I can't share with you all of these results. You'll find them in my book. But we did find that using the Skinner Health Lifestyle Survey, that adults with ADHD reported impaired health uh, and, and lifestyle that would be viewed as a medical risk in at least nine of the domains on the Skinner questionnaire. And among those were difficulties with driving, which has been well documented previously, as well as problems with social interactions, both in the workplace and elsewhere, difficulties with using tobacco, alcohol, and illegal prescription uh, use of, excuse me, prescription drugs, uh, and also problems with family functioning as well as with sleep. They also reported a broad range of antisocial activities in their history. You'll see a sampling of those here. Uh, difficulties with stealing and shoplifting, uh, problems with assault, uh, and as you see here, uh, as a result of this, they were more likely to have been arrested and put in jail because of these antisocial activities. Now, others have also looked at the workplace functioning of adults with ADHD, including the recently published finding from the World Health Organization World Mental Health Survey published by DeGraff and colleagues, in which a large sample of adults were studied across 10 countries, including over 3,000 adults in the United States. And if we look specifically at the U.S. Uh, data from this study, we find that, first of all, 4.5% of the individuals who were employed or self-employed in this study had adult ADHD. And just as we found in the Kessler study, only about 12, 12.5% of these individuals had been treated for their adult ADHD in the previous 12-month period. 
So again, we see that ADHD has a significant effect on workplace functioning and is a rather common disorder in the population. Here you can see one of the results from this particular study, a very important result, showing that ADHD on average affected the work performance of this indi these individuals on an average of 28 workdays. That's about a month and a half of workdays in which they reported being underproductive, either in the quantity or quality of their work or in days missed from their workplace. So we see a huge economic impact of ADHD in adulthood in the workplace area. Now, Joe Biederman also published a large study two years ago of adults with ADHD, over 500 of these adults compared to 500 in a control group. He also examined and major life activities in this study. And here you see that ADHD was found to have a significant impact on the uh, average earnings of these individuals, especially for those who had a high school education that earned significantly less than others who didn't have ADHD, and also those who had college graduate or some postgraduate education. Uh, Biederman also found, as did we, that there was a significant effect of adult ADHD on social relationships, especially those involving family members. Now, both Biederman's study and my own UMass study indicated that there are serious consequences of untreated ADHD in the population. Biederman found at least twice the divorce rate uh, in his study than in the control group. He also reported a significant impairment in educational attainment. We also found nearly twice as many of our individuals had been fired from a job. They were more likely to have speeding tickets, two to three times the rate of automobile accidents. And of course, we found that, as I reported earlier, more than twice as many of these adults had reported being arrested. So in summary, we can conclude that Compared to both clinical control groups and community control groups, ADHD in adults is first of all a valid psychiatric disorder. It is also a disorder that is quite distinct from other outpatient psychiatric disorders we're likely to see in a general practice. That ADHD in adults is a very prevalent disorder in the US population. Uh, and that many of these adults are likely to have at least one other disorder, if not two other disorders, with their ADHD. Our study and many others have demonstrated here this evening that adult ADHD interferes with more major life activities than most other outpatient psychiatric disorders and produces more severe impairment in each of these areas of major life activities than do these other disorders. All of this indicates as well that adult ADHD is massively undertreated in the U.S. population. So so to conclude, it is my clinical opinion that ADHD in adults is a 24-7 disorder and that it warrants treatment not just during school or work hours, but across the day, across the week, and throughout years of the lifespans of these individuals so long as impairment is present. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Barkley. And now our special guest, a patient's personal journey from childhood to adulthood with ADHD, someone who is truly in the spotlight with over 13 million viewers a week, host of ABC's highly acclaimed series, Extreme Makeover Home Edition, Ty Pennington. Thanks, Darius, and hello, Thursday Night Live. Thanks for having me as part of your program, man. I wanted to be a part of Thursday Night Live so I could tell you all really pretty much my story. Now, when I was in elementary school, my mother received countless phone calls from my teachers, the principal's office and even my guidance counselor because uh, I was constantly in trouble for something. Whether it was running around the classroom, jumping from the windowsill, or just not finishing my classwork, it seemed as though I could never really consistently work to my potential. My teachers pretty much insisted I was bright, but I just couldn't sit still. Uh, I couldn't control my impulsive behaviors or concentrate long enough to complete tasks or even listen to simple instructions. Now, my mother, a graduate student in child psychology at the time, sensed that something wasn't right. Uh, but things really hit home when she was asked to analyze the most poorly behaved student in my school. And the principal sent me. Well, she made an appointment to have me evaluated by a doctor who confirmed that I had attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, otherwise known as ADHD. However, she did not inform me of the doctor's diagnosis at the time. And as a child, I didn't know that I had ADHD and was not treated for it. But I learned to cope with the symptoms by channeling my energy into my passion, which is building things. The bigger, the better. Now, while these creative outlets helped me control my hyperactive and impulsive behaviors, I still had trouble focusing and finishing things that I really wasn't interested in. Now, getting through high school was a struggle academically as well as socially. Uh, it wasn't until I dropped out of my first year of college that I think my mother realized how much ADHD was impacting me and how it caused other people in my life to have a negative opinion of me. So she sat me down and told me I had ADHD and suggested that I talk to my doctor. Well, hearing that I had ADHD really kind of hit home. Everything started to make sense to me. My impulsive behaviors, my relationship, or lack thereof, 
and my lack of focus and organization. So I made an appointment with my doctor as soon as I could, and uh, we discussed options for managing my ADHD. So he recommended that I take a long-acting ADHD medication as part of my ADHD treatment plan, and I agreed to it.